welcome to another Lunch and Learn. My name is Kevin Holbrook from CAD Dimensions. Today we're going to talk about paperless drawings. And with the release of 2016 only being about six weeks old at this point, uh, there was many new enhancements in 2016 and enhancements for the last uh, six to eight years that maybe need to come to light a little bit as far as where is the technology today and what are our capabilities of going further along the path to becoming a more of a, a paperless uh, engineering society here. And I know this is not anything new. This has been being discussed for 20 years on how to get away from, from uh, printing uh, 2D drawings or the 2D drawings. But I want to talk about you know, kind of where the technology is today, where it's going, and uh, what the possibilities are, because I really think with the, the changes that they've had uh, in the software, we're a lot closer than we've ever been uh, to people in implementing something like this. I have a few polls before we get started here. Uh, first one, uh, just asking some information. Have you ever tried to store manufacturing information in your SOLIDWORKS model and send it to somebody. So the, the, the whole concept of maybe I can put some notes in here, maybe I can uh, you know, add all my um, you know, dimensions and GD&T and that information to my SOLID model, it probably isn't new to most of you. Let's see here, we'll get some of our votes in. Just want to kind of get an idea of what we're looking at. All right, we'll go ahead and close that poll and just share that with you. You can see what, how the group is kind of broken down. So some of you have thought about it, maybe not all of you. Uh, maybe after today you, you will. A um, couple other poll questions. Have you ever tried to implement a paperless process for SOLIDWORKS today? So in your organization, do you have terminals on the shop floor? Are your uh, manufacturing groups, you know, opening up e-drawings or using the, you know, e-drawings as a viewer on the drawings? Let's see how what we got here. It looks like it's getting close to the exact same mix here. All right, I'm going to share those numbers so you have an idea. So at least there's been some some movement where people wanting to get to more of a paperless direction here. And my very last question is here, is really just a, you know, your desire going forward. For those of you who have not partaken into going paperless, uh, you know, does your company have any efforts going on where you're trying to reduce or eliminate paper drawings? You know, is this, is this something that you want to do? I mean, you look at things just like, uh, paper and toner costs uh, and what that could add up to be in an entire year. But I'll go ahead and close this, give you an idea here. So everyone's, you know, got some input towards uh, getting to this point. And really the goal of my webinar today is to, again, talk about the technology, where it happens to be and where it's going. So our agenda today uh, we want to talk about what, it, what really is the problem. Why, why do we even talk about this, I guess? Um, what is paperless and what we mean by that? And then we're going to get into the technology, uh, the tool that we're going to use to get closer to being completely paperless. Um, and then we're going to talk about a proposed implementation for something like this because uh, you really can't change people overnight. It's, it's a more of a uh, slow process uh, in which people convert to being this way. So <clears throat> the real problem in this comes down to drawings. When you look at how much time, even for us as SOLIDWORKS users, how much time we spend detailing and making sure a drawing is 100% is right um, from notes, flag notes, making sure they match uh, the model and the locations, revision tables, title blocks, all of that other stuff. You spend a lot of time on 2D drawings, yet 60% of them don't match the models. 
at some point in time you have an issue and, and there's an issue on the drawing. So it does become a problem because you put so much time and energy into creating the drawings uh, and when they don't match, uh, you still have the same issue with the shop floor. So when I talk about paperless, I want to distinguish between what we call paperless versus drawingless. Uh, when I say drawingless, we're talking about not creating 2D drawings. Okay, uh, a drawingless environment is something that we're going to talk about today with. MBD, model-based definition. This is the ability to organize, define, and create all your dimensions, tolerances directly on the 3D model. Okay, so you don't physically create a 2D drawing as we know it today. Paperless is really focused on the media side of things, how you distribute that content that you create. Now, in a paperless environment, when you're creating 2D drawings, it might be something as simple as, you know, opening up the 2D drawing with an e-drawings viewer on the shop floor. But we're going to talk a combination of the two today. Uh, how can we get away from not creating 2D drawings by organizing the data, defining the data within the 3D model instead of creating a 2D drawing, and then how we can use that to be paperless. So how can we, again, use that next step of e-drawings, or in this case, a PDF, to go that route. So let's talk more about what is model-based definition. Now, model-based definition still has the same goal. We need to be able to manufacture our parts. We need to communicate everything that it takes to get to that end goal. From the SOLIDWORKS model to each machinable feature, we typically create a 2D SOLIDWORKS drawing. The goal with model-based definition is that we're going to put all the product manufacturing information directly into the solid model. Now we're talking the same content that you would be provided in a 2D drawing is now provided in a 3D model. Now the first thing that comes to mind when you talk about that is, that's great, if I can hand that to somebody and they have everything, you know, do I really care? And, and only you can answer that. However, I've got to be able to communicate that information to somebody. I've got to be able to give them a format that they can open up they can understand and view all that information. And it's got to be faster than what we know for 2D drawings today. And that's really what I'm going to go through here. SOLIDWORKS MBD, I, I really want to dig into the technology a little bit so you understand what it's trying to do in terms of adherence to existing standards. So when we look at requirements, uh, you know, ANSI ISO standards, uh, mil spec standards, um, we want to make sure using MBD that we're tied to what being in compliance with those existing standards. So some of the com common standards that uh, are referenced as far as output of, of 2D and 3D models. But I want to break these down a little bit further. If we look specifically at MIL standard 31,000A, um, there's a procurement specification that talks about technical data packages. Now, technical data packages uh, can be 2D and 3D content, but in the standard, it also defines when you only have 3D models, what that data package is to look like. And M MBD is defined in, in the Appendix B of this MIL standard. If we move on to ISO, uh, which is an adaptation for the, from the ASME standard, uh, you can also see some information in there uh, about presenting 3D models as an output and having them to be uh, somewhat equivalent to the 2D presentation of an output. So all the standards will have some part of it that allows us to control how that information will be applied. Here's just an, an excerpt from the uh, ANSI 14.4. Uh, 
uh, that defines how the PMI data is going to be applied to the 3D model. Now, with SOLIDWORKS, it's a very simple process to do this. Okay? It is a much harder process to get people to say, you know what, I'm okay getting a different format. I'm okay opening a 3D PDF. I'm okay going to e-drawings. And I'll talk more about that as we go through. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create dim expert dimensions for parts or assemblies inside of SOLIDWORKS. Now, for those of you who are online and have not seen dim expert, it has come so far, light years away from what it was. And I'm going to show that live today so you can see what the technology does and how intelligent it really is. From there, we just need to create a PDF export template, a template that accepts all of the information that I would typically dictate on the 2D drawing. I'm going to now push into either eDrawings or a PDF. We have to create that template. Third thing, we publish it. Now, for those of you who are not looking to get away from printing paper, I know the title of our webinar is paperless, but you know, I think the transition is a little bit, uh, it, it will take some time. You know, you've got uh, customers, vendors, shop floor that are going to need to print. You can still follow your existing process of being able to print, to print views that have all the dimensions associated with from this process. I'm going to take you through this. Now let's break down DIM Expert a little bit further so everyone is aware of the technology. Now DIM Expert is included in your standard CETA solvers. You have this today. But what I'm going to be talking about is taking the DIM Expert information and using it within MBD. So DIM Expert is the ability to automatically dimension and tolerance 3D models. A little background on this, there was another product that uh, did some tolerance stack up years ago and, and SOLIDWORKS invested in this product after it went defunct and introduced the DIM Expert functionality into SOLIDWORKS, I believe somewhere between 2006 and 2008. And it's been here ever since. But with the focus on MBD, they've really put a lot of effort into making it super easy to define the model in 3D even easier than it is in the 2D. So you get visual feedback to let you know how complete your dimensions are, and it displays the dimensions in the 2D drawing if you need them. So you could implement the DIM expert today and continue to do drawings and be ready to make the move to model-based definition and a different way of doing things in the future. On top of this, by using the DIM expert, it's integrated with the tolerance stack up tool that we have now in 2016 part of professional. You'll be able to use that tool. So that's DIM expert, automated dimensioning and tolerancing of 3D models. Now, this is one thing that I when I really dug into the DIM expert, you don't realize the amount of rules that are set forth by this tool. The DIM expert itself has a bunch of rule checks associated with it. So it requires you to follow the standard as to how you're going to dimension a model. It has a, over 100 rule checks. Now those rule checks don't exist on our 2D drawings, do they? Right? I can throw any dimension anywhere, double dimension, like GD and T, it doesn't, it, there's no intelligence to it. But if you use DIM Expert, it looks at the rules and says, oh, why is this tolerance frame uh, referencing a, a datum that you haven't even defined yet? It tells you those types of things. So DIM Expert is very, very smart. Now DIM Expert is built upon the idea that it's able to recognize machining features, how a part's going to be manufactured. Now, a lot of these features are very similar to what we know in SOLIDWORKS, like the hole, the countersink, the counterbore. But we don't have a feature called a cone or a notch, okay? pocket, surface. These are machining features that DIM Expert is going to use to recognize the information that we have. Now, another great thing about the DIM Expert is it works on imported models as well. 
So here's an image of a model with a bunch of dim expert dimensions, and you can see the feature tree is, has all the features in it. However, the same set of dimensions listed on an imported model. Okay, It doesn't matter where it came from, it will work on those imported models too. So I want to take you into the technology now. I want to show you how we can build these dim expert dimensions into my SOLIDWORKS model. So here I have a completed MBD model with DIM expert dimensions. Now, as I mentioned, DIM expert is part of SOLIDWORKS standard. If you've never used it, there's a tab next to your configuration manager called the DIM expert manager. And that's where we'll go to use this. Now, MBD is the tool that we're focused on today that will take the DIM expert information, allow us to organize it, and share it properly with the organization. Okay, so it goes beyond just creating the dimensions. It allows us to organize and share. Now, MBD is just something that gets turned on within the interface. It shows up as a tab within the command manager with a whole bunch of tools that are specific to creating and organizing the dimensions that we want. On top of that, at the bottom part of your SOLIDWORKS interface, you'll notice currently all of you will have, when you open a SOLIDWORKS model, a tab titled 3D Views. These 3D views are created within MBD to show various looks at dimensional information, just like a 2D drawing would. And as I kind of flip through these, you'll see the dimensions associated with each of them. And we're going to go through and create this live for you so you get a sense of how that's done. Now, just a little side note. In 2016, if 3D views were created in MBD, anybody with SOLIDWORKS will be able to open up and see these views. You only need MBD to be able to create the views, not view them. So every seed of SOLIDWORKS potentially could open up a SOLIDWORKS model and be able to view that model. So let's take a look at the model we're going to work with here. The gear plate itself is the critical component, the one I was showing you before. And if we look at how this thing is positioned and, and fastened to other components, I have two screw holes uh, that fasten it to this bottom plate. But it's critical that I get the location of this bevel gear and the shaft to line up properly so that the gears mesh. So this is how we're going to start to define our model using MBD. So if I come in here and take a look, we have our initial model. We have our 3D views tab. And you can see that I already have an existing set of views here. Um, I've captured a couple views. Now this particular view already has a note. Now how did I get that note associated with it? Well in my case it could be something as simple as going to my design library and dragging a note onto the design library. Okay, I can drag a note on there very simply and now it's tied to that particular view that I'm working with. Okay, now these notes don't they really represent what you would put on a 2D drawing, right? Things like material mass that might be in the title block. Again, we're trying to get all the information you would typically have in the title block right here in the 3D model. Now I can also do linking to properties. So the material in this case, I may want to link to the material of the SOLIDWORKS model so it can have some intelligence. It can auto update as we get going here. Now another concept that you've probably seen in SOLIDWORKS that's very prevalent uh, inside of MBD is this whole idea of annotation views. If you've never expanded the annotations folder inside the SOLIDWORKS feature tree, you may have never noticed the various views that are listed in here. What this is, it allows us to specify which dimensions belong to which view. In other words, if I'm looking at it from a right plane, just like I would a right view on a drawing, which dimensions do I want to see? 
And that's really what the annotation views are going to allow us to do. So how do we get started creating the dimensional information that we need to fully define a model as we would in a 2D drawing? Well, a couple things I want to point out up here. I can do things like inserting tables, like title block tables, bill of material tables, general tables. I can come in here and create exploded views if it's an assembly. I can do section views, even break the model if it's an extended view. But I'm going to start off here to the end, which gives me a lot of the functionality for adding the dimensions. Now, these aren't dimensions as we know them today. These aren't dimensions that you're going to double click to change the model and it's going to update the size of the model. These are all driven from the model surfaces and geometry. So in this particular case, we're going to start out by using something we call auto dimension. Now, this is where we'll start to let the software and DIM expert build what we're looking for. So in this case, we tell it the, the type of part we're working with and the type of tolerancing we want to add. We just then have to provide the datum targets. Now, because this thing gets bolted to a plate, I'm going to make that my primary datum. I need to make sure that this uh, bearing is located properly so that bearing uh, hole itself is very critical. And then the other thing is the hole for the uh, gear, the bevel gear coming out, it's important as well. Now the interesting thing about this hole is it's drilled through both parts of this plate at the same time. Now you'll notice this little box popped up in the graphics area. This is called the feature selector. When I select a surface, it's smart enough to understand that there may be other surfaces that are tied to that. So I could come over here and say, you know what? This is a compound hole because it's drilled in one spot. I can go ahead and pick the two surfaces and say OK. And now it treats that as one single item in the tree. Now, if you've used DIM Export before, you may have taken the approach that I'm going to you know, let it build all the dimensions on the model and, and then use it that way. But I think it's a much better approach, approach to say, you know what? Tell me the features that you want to dimension in this case. Now, I know my holes are very critical here, uh, so I need to select those holes. But notice what the software does. It's smart enough to understand that those holes, because they're on the same surface and they're the same depth, is part of a pattern. They don't necessarily have to be built with the same feature, but it will recognize as part of a pattern. Okay? If I want to also locate this other hole at the other end, now, once I pick what I want to auto dimension, I'll say OK. And the software builds the dimension information, in this case, using GD&T frames and dimensional data to let me know how to define those particular holes from the datums. Now, you'll notice also the color coding of the holes that we had selected, not only the datum holes, but the, the features that we had selected as well. Now that comes from a tool we call show the tolerance status. Green means that is completely locked down at this point. In other words, it's fully defined its position and size relative to the existing datum structure. Okay? So at this point in time, we have the DIM expert property manager located next to your configuration manager. It's changed a little bit now. The first thing you'll notice is there'll be an annotations folder, which shows us uh, all of the annotation views that I was just discussing and allows us to switch them. But then it shows me the types of features that it recognized. Now, these features are not SOLIDWORKS features. These are machinable features. It recognizes a plane, a cylinder, a simple hole, a pattern, and another simple hole. If I expand any of those, you can see what it was able to define for each. So for plane two, it defined it as a datum, and it put a flatness frame on here uh, for the surface flatness uh, relative to that datum. Okay, so it was able to build that in there and add a bunch of items to the tree. Now there's different ways of viewing this tree. I don't think it's as useful to see the feature types. You can change the tree display and make it annotation based and see all the annotations that were added 
to the model at this point. Now the annotation views are very simple. You find the annotation view you want, you right click on it, you can activate the annotation view and reorient the model. Okay, so now I'm active to this particular view. Um, what I want to be able to do is add the basic dimensions to locate these two holes. Now the basic dimensions is something that I could come in here and add location dimensions or add basic dimensions or I could just go to the positional tolerance and tell the software to recreate the basic dimensions for me. And it went ahead and it recreated those basic dimensions. Now if I rotate the model just slightly you'll notice that a couple of those dimensions, this three and four, actually don't show up on that plane that I was on, that top plane, because they're oriented in my model in a different way. What I can actually do, and this is a great thing, is I can select other items, other annotations, and if I just hit my tilde on the keyboard, I can now tell the software to move these to the top plane. Now if I reorient to my top plane, you'll notice that those basic dimensions, the ones that were placed on another view because they were better suited, are now moved to that particular view. Now here's where MBD comes in. Everything up to this point is DIM expert, right? I'm getting my dimensional information. MBD allows us now to start capturing this information. When I tell it to capture the view, it asks me to name the view. In this case, we'll call this my top view. But more importantly than that, we can pick the configuration it's tied to, but also the annotation view that should be showing when I go to this view. So I only want to show any annotations that are tied to my top view when I go to this view. What's great about that is if I add any other annotation to the top view, it will automatically show in this view. Very simple process. Now let's go to a different view here. Let's go try our front view. And if we look at our front view, some of the things that you'll see on that you would typically do in detailing, things like flipping your arrows, that's you're all capable of that here. It's just same way we would typically do it uh, on a drawing here. Um, we can still recreate uh, our basic dimensions just by going to the positional frame and telling it to recreate the dimension. Okay, And when I have what I want, all I have to do is capture that view, tell the software what I'm going to tie it to, and accept it. And you can see the view now is listed in my 3D views. And I can switch by double clicking back and forth to those. Now I need to put some dimensions on this whole pattern here. So I might go back to my auto dimensioning and decide to use, again, prismatic, but we're going to use plus minus tolerancing with polar pattern dimensioning. Now in this case, my datum is going to be my existing datum A, and the feature that I want to auto dimension might be one of my countersunk holes. Okay. When I apply this, notice it recognizes that as a pattern. That's something that's automatic with DIM Expert. When I do this, it's automatically going to create the dimensions, these three dimensions associated with that to fully define the location of those holes. Now, you can see how this view gets a little bit busy here. I've got all the dimensions that we had on there from the previous view, and then I've just added three or four more. This is where annotation views get really nice, because I can go ahead and insert an annotation view. Okay, I can tell it what it's associated with. In this case, it's associated with the front plane. And then I can choose which annotations to move to that view. So I want to move these three annotations. And the software is automatically going to create that new annotation view. Now if I just make sure I orient here, and I'm just going to turn off my front here, and you'll see only the three dimensions for those inner holes are located there. All I have to do is capture, and we'll call this my flange hole view. So again, my goal is to recreate the views that we would have 
typically on a drawing. So let's keep going here. Uh, let's go to my right view here. And a lot of times you may want not want to go the approach of using auto dimension. You may want to add, manually add some dimensions to it. Now you'll notice on my model based definition toolbar that we have location and size dimensions. Now those can get access through your shortcuts that you typically use inside of SOLIDWORKS, your S key, uh, your right click shortcuts. But if I wanted to start putting location dimensions in here, all I have to do is grab that and start picking the surfaces that we want to locate. Now this surface is kind of interesting because it really gets machined as one single surface and this is included within it. Now again, our, this is where our feature selector comes into play. We're, we're building in the intelligence to this so that we can say, you know what, this is a compound plane. This is part of it. So now it knows that that's all one piece. So whenever I'm dimensioning to that, it will highlight all of the surfaces. And I could go ahead and add a dimension in here to locate that. Now if I want to continue on, I could add a second dimension, maybe from that surface to the back side to give the thickness. Uh, I need a dimension from the bottom datum A to the total height here. And then a thickness dimension which represent the distance from here to here. Okay, So you're manually going in there and creating these dim expert dimensions using location. Now some of the tools beat what we're able to do in 2D drawings. For instance, dimensioning the length of this angled edge. You know, in SOLIDWORKS, dimensioning to the virtual sharp, uh, you know, depending on what you know as the tools, uh, it may take a little bit of time. If I go ahead and select the surface to dimension to, again, my feature selector gives me a tool called Create Intersection Line, where I can go ahead and select two surfaces it automatically creates an intersection line. I can then go up here, do the same thing for the top. It creates the intersection line for the top and then spits out the dimension. And you'll notice the dimension can be oriented in several different ways. Now I'm just going to place this off the model here just a little bit and let's orient us so we're looking straight at what we've done. So here's what I have up to this point. I have my 45 my angled dimension and the other dimensions I've added. Uh, the dimension that we put at an angle, it's kind of nice. Any of these dimensions uh, can also be flipped direction. So if I decide I want to bring this over in the Y or go up in the Z or uh, go normal to another defined angle, I can do that. In this case, I want to just bring this up in the Z. Now the same thing goes for size dimensions. I have a tool for that. Size dimensions will allow me to add things like uh, radiuses. We'll go ahead and throw a chamfer value in here. Again, locking down the model at any point in time. I can show the tolerance status of the model. I can see what surfaces I have fully defined and what surfaces I don't quite have fully defined as it exists today. But all I have to do is get to the point where I've got everything I need and I go ahead and capture that particular view. Okay, now if we look at this uh, flanged hole view, okay, uh, capturing the view is very simple. Um, all right, so if we continue on here, um, I need to add a section view based upon my left view here. Let me orient this so we have what we need. Now the, the section view is so we can uh, model up the whole locations on the back side here. Um, section view is just built into MBD. I can go ahead and, and section this. So I've just cut away a little bit the model and that allows me to get to the information that I need. All I have to do is capture this when I'm ready. I can call this my inner holes. Now here's where I want to talk a little bit about the intelligence uh, built into this. Um, if I decide to add a size dimension, let's say to these holes here, 
You'll notice that the software recognizes that there's two holes. They may or may not be part of a pattern and the tolerance associated with that. Well, where's that information come from? If I go to my tools options under document properties, there's an entire section devoted to the DIM expert. Now this allows me to define how the tolerance scheme is going to be applied when it figures out the size dimensions to add. So if it's a diameter, a length, a width, a counterbore, here's the tolerance scheme. And this is all defined in the document. Location dimensions, how we dimension inclined planes, uh, chain dimensions, GD and T, max material condition, how it's used, tolerances associated with that. Um, here's an option to create basic dimensions. You saw earlier that uh, I was creating basic dimensions by right-clicking on a positional frame, and it would create the basic dimensions. I'm going to show you another, another method here. So for this particular view, we want to add a control frame, a positional control frame to this whole location. Now, it's no different than what we've done today. We have the ability to add GD and T to the solid model, but here's where the intelligence comes into play. So if I decide to add a positional tolerance here and uh, add the frame information, now watch this. I'm going to just put in a, a tertiary letter that is different than my existing tolerances. This is where DIM expert and MBD are kind of working together to do rule checks. It knows, hey, you know what? you can't add Z as a tertiary datum because you have not defined a Z. It can't work. But if I come in there and add C, it doesn't holler at me. And again, we don't have this kind of functionality at a 2D drawing. And you'll notice that it automatically created the basic dimensions. Here's another one. Watch as I flip that dimension in and out here. It will actually uh, flip the arrow styles depending on where I drop it. Okay, so the arrow flipping, uh, you can either click on it or it will auto flip. And all I have to do is capture the information. So capture the view. Uh, this was auto captured in the inner holes, so everything should be uh, located here. Now, let me clarify that. I added some more, uh, the frame and two dimensions, and it automatically got captured on inner holes because inner holes is set up so that anything I add to the left view automatically gets added to the inner holes. Now let's take a look at this uh, showing all the dimensions for a moment. You can see that I've added a lot from frames to dimensions uh, and it gets a little busy. Now here's another tool in MBD that's fantastic for uh, navigating this information. It's called dynamic annotation views. When this is on, only the annotations associated with a particular view will show up when you're, when you're within range of looking normal to that view. So you can see as I go towards the right here, it automatically activates that. If I go towards the top, you'll notice it will auto activate. And notice over here in the annotation views is that it automatically activates the view associated with it. It makes it a nice easy way to flip through and see only the dimensions that you want associated with it. Okay, so you can see we have six or so views here. Now the next question comes up is about configurations. What do we do with configurations? Well, let me activate the uh, right view here so that I'm only viewing uh, certain annotations. Now what we want to do is we want to switch configurations. Now we don't do that any different than we do today, so we just show the configuration. And you'll notice there's no dimensions associated with this from the DIM expert. DIM expert has the ability also to copy the scheme. Now when I say copy scheme, I can copy the information from the source configuration to this configuration, and what it's going to do is it's going to tell me any dimensions that cannot be attached to the existing surfaces. So there's surfaces that are missing. All I have to do is delete the ones that I don't want. 
I can come in there and add any size and location dimensions that I want, and then just capture the view. We'll call this uh, version 2. And now I, again, have another variation view that I can use for viewing and storage. Okay, so MBD and DIM expert. Now, how, what does that look like when we go to assemblies? Now, here's an assembly. In 2016, they extended the DIM expert so that it can be utilized in assemblies as well. Now, the MBD is going to allow you to capture views, add dimensions, add notes, add GD&T directly to the solid model. So let's take a look at what I've already done here. I have front view, right view, isometric views of the th assembly, um, things like exploded views or wireframe views for visualization, that could all be done as well. Now, if I want to add a dimension to it, it's exactly the same thing. I pick my location dimension, I pick uh, where I want it to be located, and I place it within the model. Okay, And it gets captured within the view and stored within the view. So hopefully up to this point, you kind of see the idea that I can do the same things that I can do in a drawing, but we have intelligence in here. It tells us whether we're right or whether we're wrong. If I have redundant dimensions, it's going to tell me. If I have a positional tolerance that doesn't match a datum scheme, it's going to tell me. So it has these 100 GD&T checks that it will automatically do for you. Okay. So I want to bounce back to my PowerPoint for just a moment here. And let's go right here. I want to talk about the communication side of things. None of this means anything if you can't give it to somebody to consume, right? Right now we're handing off 2D drawings. In the case of MBD, we're going to have the ability to export either an e-drawing or a 3D PDF. Now, 3D PDF, I think, is going to be the, the communication tool of choice in this case. Now, why is our 3D PDF compared to others very good? Well, first of all, it's compliant with existing standards. The accuracy, it's within one micron precision with our 3D PDF. It's very rich. In other words, it supports configurations, display states, section views, break views, uh, meta properties, so custom properties into the PDF. Uh, small file size, very easy template customization. And it supports fillable form fields. So if you hand something to somebody on the shop floor in PDF format, they can type in comments or feedback right directly into the form fields. Semantic, this has to do with our cross-highlighting. And I'll show you that here live in just a second. So let's go back to SOLIDWORKS for a moment. And I mentioned the second step in the process is to create a 3D PDF template. So right within MBD, there's a template editor. I go ahead and open the template I want to modify. <coughs> Bless me. Uh, in here we have it. So it's got a logo. It's got a placeholder, what we call the primary viewport. And then it's got the secondary thumbnail views, which are associated with the views that we had in MBD. Now this is how easy it is to create your own template. If I decide I want a, a table at the top, maybe I created a, a generic table in SOLIDWORKS, I can go ahead and tell the software I want a generic table. and I, I have this already saved here. Uh, it's just a SOLIDWORKS table template. That's all it is with information in it. And I could bring that in. These are sizable, so I can control where on that drawing this thing exists. If I want to bring in uh, text, Okay, I can decide where I want this text field to be. Okay, You control where everything is. I can add maybe a second tab in here. Uh, on the second tab, I can create what we call independent viewports. So views that we can manipulate separately. Uh, so I can pan, zoom, and rotate. Again, just helping me to communicate. Maybe I want to build material in here. 
Uh, so I go ahead and insert a bill of material. And this is all I have to do to create a template. I have my bottom table here. Okay, and notice all the snapping. It's very, very easy to create. Now, once I have the template, it's all stored in a directory, right? I have all sorts of different ways that we show PDFs depending on is it a weldman, is it, you know, what is it? And look at the finalized template here uh, that I have. I have that title screen. I have a notes section. I have a place to type in comments. And then on page two, I have the bill of material in, in two parts. So how do we use these? I'm going to start by going to the, the gear plate that we created. How do we publish this for someone to consume? Well, there's a publish the 3D PDF option that lists all of your templates. And I'm just going to pick a, a simple A4 landscape here. Now you can tell it which views that you want to take to that template, and I just pick the views associated with it. When I hit Next, uh, there's text fields that are in there as well. Now these are the, the header to the PDF. I can come in here and enter things like part number, uh, description, material, comments. Uh, some of them are edited, edible fields. Okay. And in the end, what I end up with is a PDF. I'm going to take this right to my desktop and save it out. Now, you'll see what this PDF looks like. This is 3D PDF. Uh, we've had support for this in SOLIDWORKS for quite some time. Um, it has functionality very similar to eDrawings, but uh, in a format that's much easier to be consumed. So once this completes, my 3D PDF will be created here. All right. So, so here's my, my 3D PDF using that particular template. I have a notes field, which is just something I can edit. Uh, this is just a blank field. You can see my header has information or fields that can be pulled from the model itself. But here's the real key to this, is I now have, instead of a 2D drawing, I have a 3D PDF that I can now go to the particular views, for instance, this front view, and I can pick a dimension associated with that view. Okay, and when I pick a dimension, you'll notice it highlights the geometry associated with that dimension. So you think about that communication with the shop floor or with your vendor. Uh, I mean, the clarity that's provided with a tool like this. I want to show you a few other tricks in here that uh, have been questions asked by our customers uh, relative to this. First one is, can I measure? And the answer is also yes. There is a 3D measurement tool in here as well. So I can go ahead and measure, you know, sizes. Remember how I mentioned the accuracy within uh, one micron? We can go ahead and measure. Uh, another one was the ability to go ahead and attach files to the PDF. So let's say you wanted to send them a step file. And I'm trying to remember exactly. Here you go. So there's an annotations section to the free Adobe product that allows you to attach a file. Now what it does is it just pushes, puts a push pin in here and then allows you to pick the file you want to attach. Now I'm just going to pick a SOLIDWORKS part here and I can go ahead and attach that as an attachment. Okay, and now this actually, when you send the PDF, it will actually physically have the file associated with it. So here's the 3D PDF. Now let's take a look at the assembly because I want to show you some of the functionality of, of cross highlighting. If I decide to export or publish the 3D PDF using the other assembly template, let's see what we have here. I tell it what views I want to bring with it. Now notice there's an option in here uh, to choose what the ind independent viewport is. So if I want the independent viewport to start out as the uh, ISO view, I pick the ISO view and say OK. And again, the software is going to generate the PDF. OK, 
Okay, when it's completed, Now, some of the things, I mean, an hour is kind of short for a webinar on the DIM Expert. There's a lot of other tools built into that. All the tolerances that we talked about that are added automatically, those can be adjusted. You can change the look and feel of all of those dimensions just like you would any other. Okay, if I look at the PDF for the assembly, remember my title header with all that information? We have a notes section. We have a typable field. We have the various views that contain all the information that's, uh, you know, you can pan, zoom, and rotate. And we have page two of the PDF, which is independent views that I can view separately here. And when I say view separately, I can actually use my views tool just like we would in eDrawing and say, okay, show me the exploded here and this one here. Now watch this. If I pick a part, it highlights in the bill of material at the bottom. If I pick a part within the bill of material it highlights uh, in the views if it's showing as well. So there, that's what we mean by the semantic, the, the highlighting, the usefulness of the 3D PDF. Now I didn't show e-drawings, but you can publish an e-drawing. It still does the highlighting, but I think there's more benefit to using 3D PDF. Um, it supports logos. 3D PDF will do your logos. Uh, all sorts of things are built into the support for 3D PDF. So let's talk a little bit more about the reality of this situation, right? So the conversation is really about what option do I have if I didn't want to create a 2D drawing and I wanted to go paperless? Well, you could use MBD to create all the views and, and mimic all the views on a 2D drawing. And then you could give someone a 3D PDF. Now, I certainly don't think that most companies are going to just get away from paper. But this is a process in which you could start to bring yourself away from paper. For those of you who are still relying on paper, these PDFs can be printed just like a drawing would. You can print out each view, so each view is a page. So if they needed a drawing, you could certainly have something that was paper-based. Now, you probably, if you're going to implement something like this, there's going to be a parallel process for some time. You're going to have to develop a template. And if these files are going outside your organization, you're going to have to introduce your vendors and manufacturing to it. And, you know, the, the customers that we have that have already went to this, uh, they don't get a whole lot of pushback as long as all the data is there, as long as all the information is contained within it. If I need the DXF DWG, I can attach it as a, an attachment to the PDF. And just keep in mind it can be printed if, it, if needed. So all the imp information that you have in a 2D drawing can be contained in, in the 3D PMI data. So I want to thank you for attending today. We do have a few questions. I'll go ahead and answer those. Okay, uh, the cost of a seed MBD, and I, you can't quote me directly because uh, I'm really not that associate, but about two grand for a seed MBD. When you start to look at the cost of an MBD seat versus the cost of doing drawings, uh, really looking at the ROI, there is an ROI tool for this as well to understand how much time savings you could potentially have not having to manage and save and, and create 2D drawings versus having the 3D PDF. So about two grand is the, is the case there. Do we have training classes for MBD? Uh, I have to check on that, but I believe there is currently a book for MBD. So uh, if there is, then we definitely have training classes. Again, this is only uh, a few months out here. so. We're really uh, just getting going with its its usefulness and its power, and we've we've already sold a few seats to customers like yourselves. Uh, is 3D PDF a separate program from the standard PDF reader? No, 3D PDF has been built into the standard PDF reader for quite some time. I want to say like release eight or ten or 
it, it's, it's been six or seven years now. But unless you had the ability to generate a 3D PDF, uh, you wouldn't have known that it was even there. Um, we take advantage of the technology that Adobe has in the 3D PDF tool, and we write a lot of our information directly to that 3D PDF. Uh, can the assembly bombs be exported to Excel? Not from the PDF, but however, you can export them from SOLIDWORKS and put them as an attachment to the PDF, so maybe that's a, a great way to do that. How do you know when a model is fully defined in the DIM expert? Uh, there is a tool uh, that shows the tolerance status that I was showing. Let me just uh, take you to that here. So the show tolerance status is what shows us which surfaces have been fully defined. So I'm still missing, obviously I didn't add all the dimensions for a part like this. Um, in the hour that we're working, but you can see what has or hasn't been defined. And you'll notice as I do things like adding a size dimension on this fillet here, that it updates the status of that particular surface. Okay, and then a question, so can that be added to any SOLIDWORKS level or only in professional? Uh, it can be added to any SOLIDWORKS level. It is a, a separate item that can be purchased for two grand and and again just to have it and get people acclimated with the ability to not have to create a 2D drawing uh, and and, I, and just a reminder just the ability to add your title blocks and all the other information as well you know I can add a title block if I have a template here you can see I can add a title block uh, directly to the draw the the 3D model here, and that could be exported also to PDF. Okay, so I want to thank everyone for coming today. I hope that you found this useful, and uh, hopefully you can take a next step at uh, trying to become a little more paperless, a little more electronic, and moving towards the world of MBD. Thank you. Don't forget to check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and our blog for more great content by clicking on the links in the description below.